Johnny Pitts, Afropean, Notes from Black Europe. Dive into the compelling journey of author Johnny Pitts as he ventures across Europe to unravel the multifaceted Afropean identity, in his book, Afropean, Notes from Black Europe. Exploring the cultural and racial dynamics of various cities such as Sheffield, Paris, Brussels, Amsterdam, Berlin, Stockholm, and Lisbon, this book summary delves into the challenges faced by Black Europeans and the communities that break the barriers of a supposedly divided world. Discover the history, struggles, and successes of these communities as they navigate their unique Afropean identities. Crumbling Multicultural Identity Growing up in the multicultural, working-class district of Sheffield called Firth Park, Johnny Pitts experienced the vibrant mix of cultures, dynamic street scenes, and the rise of hip-hop. But as socioeconomic pressures mounted in the mid-1990s, the neighborhood's thriving cultural life began to crumble. Disillusioned, Johnny embarked on a journey across Europe to explore the meaning of being Black and European simultaneously. In his childhood, Johnny Pitts never paid much attention to his dual identity as a Black European. Born to an African-American father and a white British mother, Johnny's mixed heritage was common in Firth Park, historically diverse Sheffield neighborhood. This lively community hosted people from different backgrounds, including descendants of immigrant workers, white working-class families, second-generation immigrants, and refugees from various countries. Firth Park's diverse residents created a colorful and racially tolerant atmosphere, evidenced by the blend of Yemeni weddings, reggae parties, and various cultural celebrations happening around. From the 1970s to the 1990s, the neighborhood developed into a center for black cultural movements, particularly hip-hop. Johnny was introduced to this underground scene through his friends Leon and Muhammad, who showed him the ins and outs of Sheffield's hip-hop culture, including illegal parties and pirate radio station SCR. However, as global economic forces challenged the local industries many of Firth Park's residents relied on, the neighborhood's sense of cultural richness began to decay. By the mid-1990s, a disheartening aura of poverty and desperation enveloped the area, with families and friends falling victim to unemployment, substance abuse, and crime. Pitt's experiences in London further troubled his multicultural identity. After being exposed to the harsh realities of racial divisions outside his Sheffield upbringing, he felt disconnected from both his black and brown communities and the predominantly white society that seemed to reject them. As a response to this identity crisis, Johnny decided it was time to explore what it meant to be black and European simultaneously. To find answers, he embarked on a journey across the continent, aiming to understand the unique challenges, stories, and achievements of the black European community. By connecting with people from different cultures and background, Johnny hoped to get insight into his own sense of self while shedding light on what it meant to navigate the complexities of a dual identity. Uncovering Black Europe Contrary to common belief, Black Europeans contribute significantly to the vibrant culture of cities like Paris, which boasts a rich history of African and African-American influences. These include colonial ties, literary connections, and musical movements like jazz, introduced during World War I by the Harlem Hellfighters. While discrimination and racial injustice still persist, reminders of Afropean history tell the story of a diverse, interconnected Europe. Black Europeans, often first- or second-generation immigrants from countries such as Mozambique or Ghana, may be invisible for those living outside culturally diverse neighborhoods like Firth Park. Working in jobs such as cleaning, driving taxis, or managing security, these individuals can find themselves confined to the margins of society, creating the impression that Black Europe does not exist. However, one visit to Paris dismantles this myth. Paris, along with London, is one of the blackest cities in Europe. Neighborhoods like Barbes Rochecourt and Chateau Rouge host various African communities, marked by Moroccan stores, Senegalese eateries, and Pan African art galleries. These connections to African culture date back to French colonialism and even manifest through literary figures like Alexander Dumas, author of The Three Musketeers and grandson of an enslaved Haitian woman. 
the city's links with Black America may come as a surprise to some. During World War I, African American soldiers from the Harlem Hellfighters were stationed in France, exposing the French to jazz music and other cultural novelties. Soon, Parisians gained an appreciation for African American culture, and the feeling was mutual. Alongside New York's Harlem Renaissance, famous black American figures like writer Richard Wright and singer Josephine Baker found themselves drawn to Paris during the 1930s Negritude movement, celebrating black art and beauty. This Afropean legacy continues to this day in Paris, despite persisting racial inequalities and occasional insensitive remarks by people like French perfumer Jean-Paul Guerlain. The outrage that followed his use of a racial slur on national television reveals the strength and resilience of the modern Afropean spirit. Standing united, black Parisians from all walks of life continue to push against racial injustice and work towards creating an inclusive society. In a world where black Europeans face societal inequalities, acknowledging and celebrating Afropean history and culture is crucial. The ties between Europe, Africa, and black America echo throughout the boulevards of Paris as a reminder of a diverse and interconnected European identity. Unraveling Afropean Identity Beneath Brussels' seemingly ordinary and bureaucratic surface lies a brutal chapter of history involving Belgium's colonial rule in the Congo. Here, the Afropean identity emerged from the colonialist legacy through the efforts of Belgian Congolese artist Marie Dalm, as well as the African communities in the district of Matange. These cultural nomads strive to create a unified, holistic black European identity, bridging the gap between their African roots and European upbringing. Brussels, once deemed Europe's most boring capital, bears a dark, hidden past. In the early 20th century, Belgium's colonial rule in the Congo led to the deaths of over 10 million Congolese people, a brutal chapter in Afropean history. Yet it is within this colonialist legacy that the new Afropean identity was born. At the Royal Museum of Central Africa, Africa Museum, a stark contrast to Brussels' clean, bureaucratic facade, it becomes increasingly apparent that Belgium has yet to confront its colonial past. Built by King Leopold II for the 1897 World Fair, the museum houses colonial-era relics, barely explained, and live exhibitions of Congolese people from that time. Exploring Brussels further, one can find colonialist propaganda, such as the 1931 Tintin comic entitled Tintin in the Congo, which perpetuates racist caricatures and paints Belgium's invasive history in an untruthful light. Despite this dark history, the concept of Afropeanism emerged, championed by Belgian Congolese singer Marie Dong, who first coined the term while working with Talking Heads frontman David Byrne. This subtle manifesto combined African and European influences to create a new, unified black European identity. This fusion of cultures is embodied in the vibrant district of Matange, where Congolese, Rwandese, and Senegalese communities come together, offering a mix of restaurants, thrifty stores, and jazz clubs. Within this flourishing Afropean culture, black individuals such as Johnny find a sense of belonging. They identify as cultural nomads who, despite not fitting into a particular class, race, or nation, find solace in the fluidity of their Afropean lineage. Through these unique experiences in Brussels, the compelling Afropean identity emerges, bridging the gap between African heritage and European upbringing. Preserving Afro-Surinamese Legacy The Afro-Surinamese community in Amsterdam shares a deep historical connection with New York City. A vital part of the Harlem Renaissance, these culturally and politically engaged individuals also played a role in the spread of Marxist ideas throughout the 20th century. Modern Afro-Surinamese activists in Amsterdam, led by the New Urban Collective, work to preserve the legacies of past revolutionaries, such as Otto and Hamina Hueswoud, who used their Dutch passports to migrate to Amsterdam after facing exile due to anti-communist sentiments in the United States. By keeping these activist stories alive, the new urban collective seeks to inspire a new generation of Dutch Afropeans to fight against contemporary issues, such as the racially charged Swart Peak character that appears during the Christmas season. Amsterdam's Afro-Surinamese community has long been rooted in social activism. 
descended from enslaved West Africans who were brought to the Netherlands during colonial times, these individuals have worked together to form a unique and politically engaged community. Over the years, they have contributed to significant movements such as the Harlem Renaissance, the Surinamese independence movement, and the spread of international Marxist politics. Today, the heart of this community can be found in the Hugo Olichfeld House, a multifunctional community center that's home to the New Urban Collective, a queer feminist network of Afro-Dutch students working to preserve black history. Their black archives house the works of notable black thinkers such as Jamaican poet Claude McKay and American civil rights leader W.E.B. Dubois. One intriguing, overlooked aspect of the archives is the story of Dutch-American revolutionaries Otto and Hermina Huiswoud. Both hailing from Guyana, the couple met in Harlem amidst a thriving community of black intellectuals and creatives. Otto later became the first black founding member of the American Communist Party and even met Lenin in Moscow. However, as anti-communist sentiments grew in post-World War II America, the Huiswouds were exiled. Using their Dutch passports, they migrated to Amsterdam, where they took charge of the Afro-Surinamese organization on Suriname, turning it into a vehicle for socialist politics. The New Urban Collective is dedicated to preserving the legacies of Afro-Surinamese activists like the Huiswouds, aiming to inspire and mobilize the Dutch Afropean community. These efforts have already led to successes such as significant protests against the racially insensitive character Swart Piet that appears during the Dutch Christmas season. By keeping these histories alive, the New Urban Collective hopes to empower the present and future generations of Dutch Afropeans to play an active role in shaping a more equitable and inclusive society. Berlin's Unconventional Communities In wintry Berlin, Johnny discovers the contrasting worlds of Antifa, an anti-fascist organization with its roots in resistance movements against the Nazis, and the multicultural heart of a thriving Rastafarian community. In contrast to Antifa's primarily white, Young members, Johnny finds solace in the diverse Rastafarian group and its celebrations of their unique mixed identity. During his stay at a hostel in Berlin, Johnny is told that he will encounter an ugly city full of beautiful, open people. He finds this to be true when he stumbles upon an anti fascist demonstration and learns about the Antifa, an organization that has roots in Nazi resistance movements. However, he notices that the Antifa march he joins is primarily composed of young, white participants, seemingly contradicting the group's stand against racism and fascist violence. Racism remains a significant problem in Germany, as evidenced by over 130 racially motivated killings since the fall of the Berlin Wall, including the notorious National Socialist underground murders. In search of a more diverse community, Johnny discovers a Sudanese restaurant where he meets Muhammad, a self-proclaimed black prophet. Muhammad invites Johnny to the Young African Artist Market, YAM, a community center, nightclub, and youth center that serves as the center of Berlin's vibrant Rastafarian community. As Johnny immerses himself in the Rastafarian culture, he learns the fascinating history behind it, Rastafari Makoan, an Ethiopian royal and the religion's namesake, inspired a whole new movement that blends elements of Christianity, African folklore, black power politics, and pan-Africanism. Intrigued by the convergence of these beliefs in Rastafarianism, Johnny observes how both white Germans and West African immigrants alike have adopted the cultural practices at YAM. Surrounded by this beautiful yet uncommon blend of culture, he is reminded of the words by the Afro-German poet, May I am, I will be African even if you want me to be German and I will be German even if my blackness does not suit you. Johnny's experience in Berlin highlights the stark contrast between the Antifa, who exemplify particularistic racial identification, and the Rastafarian community, which celebrates the fusion of multiple cultures and ethnicities. The two groups represent the ongoing struggle to create a more inclusive, just world in which people can embrace and find solace in diverse communities, regardless of their backgrounds. Sweden's Afropean Dichotomy Scandinavian countries, particularly Sweden, embody a European utopia with their robust social security, free healthcare and education systems, and progressive culture. Sweden appears as a haven for many Afropeans, including a multitude of successful black individuals finding recognition in the media, 
such as TV hosts, chefs, and musicians. This success, in part, stems from the nation's socialist philosophy of Fokamet, which promotes the idea of a unified family encompassing the whole country. However, beneath the surface, Sweden struggles with recognizing the roots of racial injustice. Sala, a Tunisian bouncer Johnny met, aptly stated that Europeans believe they are doing immigrants a favor, but their presence is often due to the destruction of their home countries. This observation rings true as Sweden stands as the third largest arms exporter globally, with its arms fueling wars in the Middle East and military coups in Africa. Saab, a former car company, is responsible for manufacturing most of these weapons. Despite the damaging presence of a thriving arms trade, many well-educated Swedish Afropeans tend to be critical of newer black immigrants for not adhering to Swedish cultural and social norms. For instance, Lucille, an Afro-Cuban Swedish student, expresses concern over young individuals adopting Rinkby Swedish, the slang of the country's largest immigrant neighborhood. Rinkby, a once ambitious housing project for immigrants led by Socialist Prime Minister Olaf Palm, has devolved into impoverished, grey high-rises since Palm's assassination in 1986. Stockholm's modern-day reality reflects a disconnect here the ideal of social democracy has degraded, reserved only for the bourgeoisie and unjustly relegated poorer immigrant communities to the city outskirts. This two-faced perspective presents a deeper concern for the Swedish identity, revealing that even the most progressive environments are not immune to harboring racial injustices. Moscow's Lost Multicultural Identity Once well acquainted with the embrace of Moscow's welcoming aura, Johnny had little reservations about his visit. Although present-day Russia has witnessed a surge in racial prejudice, targeting predominantly African immigrants, Moscow was once an appealing destination due to its multicultural ideals. Famed writer Alexander Pushkin and African-American actor Paul Robeson are enlightening examples of notable figures in Russian history with African roots. However, Moscow's earlier narrative of promoting international harmony has drastically transformed. Histories tell of the Soviet Union's humanist vision, as it supported black Americans and Africans' plight for equal rights and independence. Communist ideology cultivated strong ties between Russia's white working class and black resistance movements, in a stand against imperialism, oppression, and exploitation. This influence was so powerful that prominent African students were encouraged to attend Russian universities from the 1950s to the 1980s. As a result, several black American and African leaders adopted socialist and communist ideologies. In response to these ties, Western powers executed an aggressive effort to dismantle these alliances, assassinating black and socialist leaders globally. Leaders such as Martin Luther King Jr., Olaf Palm, and Patrice Lumumba fell victim to covert operations by American intelligence agencies. Ultimately, the West declared its victory upon the Soviet Union's demise in 1991. Consequently, Moscow's spirit of collective unity in multiculturalism declined. Modern Russian leaders, like Vladimir Putin, spurred the rise of nationalism, xenophobia, and homophobia. Presently, African students face the residual impact of this shift as they encounter unabashed racism from white Russians. Often constrained to remain within their university campuses, their experiences now lack the warmth of Moscow's past camaraderie. Today, the People's Friendship University of Moscow houses a somber reality as African students share their space with addicts and alcoholics on the city's periphery. The high-minded multicultural aspirations of a once-tolerant Moscow have withered with the passing of time. Afropean Utopia in Marseille Johnny's journey takes him through the mesmerizing coast of Provence, where he encounters stunning villas with striking histories linked to colonial times and the bloodshed of African people. Among these magnificent residences, he discovers the former home of James Baldwin, a celebrated black novelist, who represented a unique kind of French dream. As he moves on to Marseille, Johnny finds himself captivated by the city's multiculturalism, working-class politics, and rich artistic heritage. With immigrants from North Africa, Romania, and a white working-class population coexisting in harmony, Marseille truly embodies the Afropean utopia Johnny had been seeking. Vibrant Afro-P Uncovered 
Marseille and Lisbon exemplify Afro-P, a blended world where African Europeans and European Africans interconnect, standing firm against racism and other forms of oppression. Portugal's Afropeans, rooted in former colonies like Mozambique, Cape Verde, and Angola, created a vibrant community in Lisbon's Cova de Moura. The neighborhood's lively street culture and the Associacao cultural de juventude display a thriving and hopeful Afropean present and future. Marseille, a multicultural, working-class city, embraced a vision of Afro-P, where African Europeans and European Africans come together in an interconnected community, defying racism, fascism, and economic exploitation. However, it was in Lisbon where the presence of Afropeans from former Portuguese colonies truly shone through. These Afropeans, many of whom can trace their roots back to Mozambique, Cape Verde, and Angola, have experienced bidirectional immigration during colonial times, making their European and African identities inseparable. Johnny discovered this blend when he met his Lisbon guide, Nino, a member of a family that exhibits such cultural fusion. Cova de Mora, an underprivileged Lisbon neighborhood, serves as home to a portion of Portugal's Afropean population. Despite the area's reputation as a no-go zone for outsiders and local police, it stands as a vibrant and colorful district, featuring murals of black icons, lively streets, and a strong sense of community. As Jacare, one of Nino's friends, explained, residents wouldn't leave the area even if they could. Within the heart of Cova de Mora is the pivotal Associacao Cultural de Juventud, established in the 1980s. This community center functions as a children's library, a point of support for women's rights, an advisory bureau for citizens, a recording studio, and a hub for many other cultural activities. It represents the beating heart of the neighborhood, hosting live Afrobeat music and traditional Cape Verdean celebrations. This vibrant street culture found in Cova de Mora represents one of the many hidden Afropean narratives that Johnny encountered throughout his journey. His final stop took him to Gibraltar, where on a clear day, one can see Africa from the European coast. Though visibility was poor when Johnny arrived, he realized that he already had an up-close experience of Africa's essence in the spirit and lives of Afropeans inhabiting several corners of Europe. It is through these diverse African communities that Johnny found the hope and reassurance that Afro-P not only had an impactful past, but also possesses a vibrant present and a promising future. In Afropean, Notes from Black Europe, Johnny Pitts brings us along on his enlightening journey through various cities such as Paris, Brussels, Amsterdam, and Lisbon, among others, to uncover the diverse and often overlooked narratives of Black Europeans. Through his travels, Pitts encounters history, culture, resistance, and ultimately, hope for a more inclusive future. He demystifies complex notions about multiculturalism, identity, and racial alliances while shedding light on the intricate tapestry of the Afropean experience throughout Europe. The stories within this book summary reveal that Afropea has a vibrant present, a rich past, and a promising future.